she was ready. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, I'm Beth Norton, your Director of Music Ministry. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm delighted to see all of you this morning, and we're gonna start with us with singing together. So I invite you to rise and open to, um, if you wanna look at the hymn book, it's number 1003. Um, the words should be appearing on the screen. It's where do we come from? And we're gonna sing this, um, we're kind of making a musical wave here is what it's like. We're all going to have this group start the first part, and then the middle people are going to sing the second part. Don't really tell you what to sing. While the first group keeps singing the first part, we're going to layer on, and then we'll layer on. And then at some point, I'll cut you off and tell you what to sing. It'll be great. Anderson, would you give us that? Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? Where do we come from? Welcome. Hello. <laughs> and welcome to First Parish in Concord. I am the Reverend Jennifer Johnson. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am your candidate for the next settled ministry. <laughs> I am delighted to welcome all of you here on this last Sunday of what has been for me a life transforming candidating week. We are a member of the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations and love lies at the center of our faith. We covenant to transform and grow spiritually and ethically as we adapt to a changing world. With humility and reverence, we acknowledge our place in the great web of life. In this congregation, we affirm that black lives matter as we embrace our differences and commonalities with love, curiosity, and respect. We are glad you are here. If you are visiting us online this morning, welcome. 
Let's give a wave, the camera at the back of the sanctuary to our online participants. And if you're visiting in person, we invite you to stop by the welcome table and say hello. I do have a couple of very quick announcements before we begin our service. If you are new and or have questions about First Parish in Concord, you can please see the standing committee representative for today, Caroline Menken. And you may also see an usher or greeter if you need assistance. Another exciting announcement, the new church directories are here at long last. Everyone who had their photo taken is entitled to one. So if that's you, and only if that's you, please pick up your directory after the service and the special congregational meeting this morning. They are in the parish hall, and there are stickers marking them with the name of those who should get one. And our last announcement will come from the chair of your standing committee, Gib Metcalf. Good morning. Uh, as, as Jennifer said, I'm Gib Metcalf, chair of the standing committee. Uh, it's just a pleasure to see this full congregation today. Uh, after the service, uh, please come down quickly, uh, get a cup of coffee. There's a little bit of food if you need some food in the, in the kitchen. But mainly come down and get your ballot for voting. Check in at the check-in tables uh, so that we can come back into the sanctuary and begin our meeting promptly at 11.30 or as close to 11.30 as we can. And if you're on Zoom, if you're going to be participating in, in, the, um, uh, in the special congregational meeting on Zoom, please be sure to check in, uh, uh, on, enter the Zoom meeting with the Zoom link that was in the FP Weekly announcement yesterday uh, and be in there with enough time because you'll be put into a waiting room before you're then entered into the meeting while they check to, ma uh, check to make sure who is a member. So I look forward to seeing people back here in the sanctuary after the service at 1130. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Please stand if you are able for our first hymn. It's hymn 1020. You don't have to have your book because we have it on the screen. So please join us.
I invite you now to deepen into our time of worship together with these words adapted from Robert R. Walsh. When the great plates slip and the earth shivers and the flaw is seen to lie in what you trusted most, look not to more solidity, to weighty slabs of concrete poured or strength of cantilevered beam to save the fractured order. Trust more the tensile strands of love that bend and stretch to hold you in the web of life that's often torn but always healing. The shifting plates, the restive earth, your room, your precious life, they all proceed from love, the ground on which we walk together. Come, let us worship together. And let us begin with the lighting of our chalice. Please join in the chalice lighting response. The words will appear on the slide. O oh, flame of our faith, open our hearts and fill our bodies and souls with persistent strength. Enliven our spirits and engage us deeply in this life of ours, this sacred, essential moment now. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have invited Jennifer to offer our children's message this morning because part of her ministry is to all ages. And so I thought it was very important that she was able to address all ages this morning. So I hand this microphone to you. Thank you, Amy. It's so good, actually. I, I really like the view from the pulpit, but this is really nice, too. We are on the cusp of a new relationship. And when new people come into our lives, we have the opportunity to decide if we want to be in relationship with each other. And that's one of the things that we're doing at church today. We're deciding about being in a relationship, a very special relationship as minister and congregation. So how do we begin new relationships? What are some of the ways we behave when we want to be in a relationship with someone new? Perhaps a new classmate or a teacher at school or a new family in your neighborhood or a new minister at your church. One thing that we do is we welcome the new person. Because I am new at First Parish in Concord, people here have been welcoming me so warmly all week long. One of the special ways that you welcome me is with the banners that the young people made that are hanging in the hallway outside the parish hall and on my door. And they made me smile and feel very welcome every time that I looked at them. Thank you for doing that for me. After we welcome new people into our lives, after we've done the welcoming, what comes next? How do we get to know one another better? We share, right? We tell each other about who we are and we, the things that we love and care about, and we listen to the other person about what they love and care about. We re make relationships with new people in our lives by opening our hearts to them. Since I'm new to you and you are new to me, I wanted to spend a little time this morning opening my heart to you by telling you about some, just a few of the people and the things that I love and care about. So once again, I brought some slides to help me tell you about them. Can we please have the first slide? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that is my puppy, Cooper. He's not really a puppy, he's seven years old, but we adopted him when he was a puppy. And he is a very sweet dog, 
and he's also a little bit of an anxious dog. We were told that he was not treated very well when he was a puppy. And so we rescued him and made a home for him in our family. And we have to be really attentive to what Cooper likes and doesn't like. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a really sweet boy, so I love him very much. And I spend a lot of my time caring about Cooper. Next slide, please. Those are my two daughters. Amelia is on um, your left and Carly is on your right in the picture. They are the center of my world, the loves of my life, and I'm so happy to raise them together with my husband, Dave. They are both going to be at college. If you vote for me and I become your minister, and come back in the fall, they will be at college, but they're both excited to come here when they can and get to know you too. Um, so you'll also maybe see them here today because they're sitting three pews back. <laughs> and you can get to know them too. Next slide, please. And that's me and my husband, Dave. And I'm sharing this photo because it shows us doing one of the activities that we most love to do together, which is taking walks in the beautiful trails of New England along woodlands and wetlands. And that was a beautiful day. We were staying in Kennebunkport, Maine, and um, that's one of my most favorite ways to enjoy being alive. And the last slide. <laughs> I figured you might want to know something more practical. I love pizza, especially thin crust, Italian style, wood fired pizza, and just plain cheese. I'll eat it with other stuff on it, but I really love good plain cheese pizza. Um, so there you go. Those are just some of the things about me, some of the things and the people that I love and care about. But what about you? Relationships are not a one-way street. They have to go both ways. So I would love for you to share with me. I would love to learn what you love and care about. I've had many meetings this past week, mostly with the grown-ups in the church, and I have learned from them about much of what they love and care about, and I look forward to learning more the grown-ups in the church have opened up their hearts to me very warmly, and I have gotten to meet some of the young people, too, and that was a real joy. But I haven't had as much of a chance as I would like to learn from the youngest children. So I came up with a little idea. I cut out some hearts, and what I would love for you to do young people when you leave today is come by me and take one of these hearts and on it I invite you to write or draw or um, whatever comes to mind um, to share something that you love that you want me to know about and then when you're done you can give your heart back to Amy and she'll make sure that I get them so please come see me as you make your way to your religious education program today. So today, of course, is a very special day, and so we invited everyone who's a sixth grader and older to stay for this very special service today. But we still wanted you to be able to share with Jennifer. So I see some of those sixth graders up in the balcony. Maybe one of you could volunteer to come down and get some of those hearts and distribute the hearts to the teens that are gonna stay in the service today. And the kindergarten through fifth graders are gonna be with Peter, myself, and Lindsay. We're gonna be making puppets today. And if you have any preschoolers, the little RE is happening downstairs. We'll make sure some of the preschoolers get those hearts too. Um, so I would like to invite the volunteers to come forward at this time. There's one already. And um, you can pass by Jennifer to get a heart. And those teens, if you could help us get them up to the balcony and, and out to the teens that are staying in the service, I'd appreciate it. Let's join together in song.
So welcome. I'm Paul Langston Daly, and I am your Minister for Social Action, and I would like to invite Eloise Newell to come forward this morning. Uh, we share our plate every month, and this month we, we are starting a new month, May 5th, and so Eloise will come forward here and share with us a little bit about the Restoration Project. This month, share the plate. Good morning. Thank you for having me today. Um, I'm the director of Restoration Project, which is a vocational rehabilitation program for people with mental illness and brain injuries. We teach the crafts of furniture finishing and upholstering to build confidence, confidence and facilitate recovery. Mindfulness, whether from meditation or an absorbing task, is restorative. It isn't the initial thoughts, but the constant repetition of them that's destructive. Mindfulness puts us in the moment and gives your unconscious brain a space to teach us peace. We identify with the work we do. We sit on the furniture we repair. We eat the confections we bake. The flowers we plant give back to us, as do the things we make. We are, trans we are restored by our own efforts. Ultimately, recovery comes from within. Everyone is accepted at Restoration Project. I am a peer specialist, not a therapist, which is to say I identify with what you're saying and I tell you what works for me, not what I think will work for you. We are all in this together. This is Mental Health Month. It would be good if we could recognize our own part in the awareness. Mental health isn't another's problem. Restoration Project moved to Belmont in 2018. We opened a thrift store that now supports us Belmont has been unusually welcoming to us. I think it's because McLean Hospital has been in their neighborhood for so many years. But we're especially grateful to First Parish Concord for not forgetting us and our work. Please come and see us. Members of the community are a vital part of our program. Your presence as customers and volunteers gives our participants a connection to the community that breaks down the barriers of stigma, helps develop social skills, and facilitates recovery. We encourage you to join our program. We'll teach you to upholster and refinish if you want to work with our participants. We need someone to repair furniture, and we have the makings of a wood shop that needs setting up. There's always something to do in the store. Thank you for your support today. There are brochures in the coffee room. I look forward to talking with you. And I just want to take a moment to say that we are deeply grateful to all those who have already made their pledge to the ongoing mission of this congregation. Pledges typically represent about 80% of our income, so every pledge in any amount is valued and appreciated. If you've not yet completed your pledge card, we invite you to do so. Soon, because we're making final adjustments to the budget now uh, for the annual meeting on June 2nd. A special thank you to our annual pledge campaign team for their dedicated work to this congregation and to all of you for your commitment and care to this community.
Today's reading takes a serious turn because we are living in serious times and because our task this morning is both joyful and solemn. The reading are excerpts taken from an article called Why Hannah Arendt Matters, Revisiting the Origins of Totalitarianism by Roger Berkowitz the founder and academic director of the Hannah Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities. The basic experience underlying totalitarianism, the experience that continues today to make it likely that totalitarianism remains a constant concern is loneliness and alienation from political social, and cultural life. What prepares men for totalitarian denomination in the non-totalitarian world, Arendt argues, is the fact that loneliness, once a borderline experience usually suffered in certain marginal conditions like old age, has become an everyday experience of the ever-growing masses of our century. Loneliness is the fear of being deserted by all human companionship. It is the experience of not belonging to the world at all, which is among the most radical and desperate experiences of man. Berkowitz goes on, as a modern phenomenon, loneliness is visible in what Robert Putnam calls the loss of social capital. Americans of all classes and all political persuasions report having fewer closer friends than ever before. Many say they have no one they can confide in or count upon in an emergency. Simone Weil wrote that, quote, to be rooted is perhaps the most important and least recognized need of the human soul, to be rooted. The modern condition of rootlessness is a foundational experience of totalitarianism. Totalitarian movements succeed when they offer rootless people what they truly crave, an ideologically consistent world, aiming at grand narratives that give meaning to their lives. By consistently repeating a few key ideas, a manipulative leader provides a sense of rootedness grounded upon a coherent fiction that is consistent, comprehensible, and predictable. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? So ends our reading.
Two things are bound to go wrong. <laughs> I found my page. <laughs> found the mic. What a week. What a week. 11 committee meetings, five staff meetings, two worship services, one coffee hour, four meet and greets, one spectacularly attended spaghetti dinner, three choir serenades, and more beautiful new faces than I can count. Many of you have asked how I'm holding up. <laughs> Thank you for your care. I have felt it all week long. Be assured, I am fantastic. <laughs> how could I not be? You have received me with tremendous warmth, enthusiasm, and open-heartedness. My heart is full and my spirits are high. My body is admittedly a little tired, <laughs> but rest will come. Before I arrived last Saturday, I knew this community only by words on paper and spoken by your search team. Let me report that they represented you faithfully with love and candor. I experienced no surprises this week, except for the Dolly Parton and Fiddler on the Roof <laughs> serenades. I've never been more delightfully surprised in my entire life. I found this community as I hoped I would. During this week of meetings and greetings, we have begun to open our hearts and minds to each other. The reality of who you are bloomed into life before my eyes. And you are beautiful. Not perfect, but human and beautifully so. The town of Concord is in bloom too. At every turn, garden beds and window boxes are abundant. The tulips and daffodils especially proud in their cheerful beauty. The idyllic charm of Concord is on full display. So much so that this week has at times felt like a dream. I've had to pinch myself. With my full heart and high spirits, I've almost forgotten to worry about the state of our world. Almost. I want us to hold on to the hope we have felt this week, to the warmth and enthusiasm, the love and the joy. We need them, they are real, and they are ours by birthright but we have to hold them alongside our grief, fear, and concern. When we take all of those feelings together, we are called to courage. I wouldn't be doing right by you if I did not name the gravity of this moment. We are setting out on our shared ministry in precarious times. So many forces have intersected and converged to destabilize our society. Among them, COVID-induced isolation, the resulting psychological and social toll, an urgently needed racial reckoning and its backlash, the social media hyped rise of alternative facts and conspiracy theories, the present and increasingly catastrophic reality of human-induced climate change. So much seems to be coming undone. Our institutions are teetering, from Congress and the Supreme Court to healthcare, public schools, and yes, religious communities. The very democracy on which our institutions rest is at stake, and we're not sure we can save it. 
My time with you reinforced my understanding that you are a community of determined thinkers and doers. You have not succumbed to despair. You are doing what you can. Yet I think, like me, you are worried that what you can do is not enough. After this worship service, if you vote to call me as your next settled minister, I will join you in early August, just three months ahead of a presidential election when the charismatic leader of an authoritarian nationalist movement may very well take power for the second time. This time even more emboldened by the failure of our political and judicial systems to hold him to account. I'm naming these hard realities this morning because as you prepare to cast your vote for your next lead minister, I need you to know that I will. And because I need you to know that I will not, no matter what, lose faith nor hope. Last week, we reflected on the winding roads that brought us together in what has indeed felt like a holy moment. Where do we come from, we asked. Throughout the week, we've begun to look to the road ahead and prepare for the journey to come. Where are we going? We will make plans for the journey. We will chart a course more than once, and we will encounter forks in the road, as well as unexpected obstacles and frustrating detours. Especially in these times when so much in our world is teetering, and when the very ground beneath us seems to be constantly shifting and sometimes even dropping away. The ride will often be wild because life is so often wild. And when it is, we will return here. Our faith will call us back to this holy and beautiful sanctuary to get our bearings, to ask ourselves, what are we? Why are we? Most fundamentally, I believe we gather in spiritual community to get our bearings. Living is a wild enterprise, and no one of us signed up for it in advance. No one of us has all the answers. No one of us can see the clear path forward. We need each other to get our bearings. Over and over again in my gatherings with you this week, so many of you told me that what you most love and value about First Parish in Concord is the community. The same is true in all the congregations I have ever known. Unitarian Universalists find our bearings in community. When the ground is shifting beneath our feet, when the great plates slip, we hold on to each other. We reach out for the tensile strands of love that hold us together in the web of life. As we prepare to embark on our ministry journey together, the first thing we need to do is remember to find our bearings in community, remember to give and receive the tensile strands of love that hold us in the web of life. Remember to keep our hearts wide open. Keep your hearts wide open. As I have attempted to make sense of the especially wild times we are living in, I have turned to the wisdom of Hannah Arendt, the 20th century political philosopher best known for her work on totalitarianism. 
A German-born Jew, Arendt herself was a concentration camp survivor who escaped and fled Nazi persecution. More specifically, I have been informed by the work of Arendt scholars today, among them Unitarian Universalists, who are illuminating the relevance of her work for understanding the current rise of white-wing authoritarian nationalism, an embrace of world leaders who bear the hallmarks of totalitarian dictators, including right here in the US. In particular, I've been haunted by Roger Berkowitz's essay, Why a Rent Matters Now, from which I shared excerpts for today's reading. Berkowitz wrote that essay in March of 2017, just a few short months after Trump assumed his presidency the last time. His insights are even more chilling in 2024. Even as his insights have chilled me though, they have also given me hope, especially as a Unitarian Universalist. Berkowitz outlines two key points from Arendt's analysis of totalitarian mass movements that I wanna lift up to you this morning. First, pervasive loneliness is the seed that prepares human beings to succumb to and even enlist in totalitarian movements. And here I, I want to pause just to roughly define totalitarianism as a system of total domination, whereas authoritarian regimes may seek total centralized control of government. Totalitarian regimes seek to dominate not just government, but all aspects of society, essentially inhibiting all forms of human freedom. Secondly, Arendt contends totalitarian movements exploit widespread loneliness and alienation by disseminating propaganda, stabilizing though fictional grand narratives that give the lonely masses a sense of meaning and belonging. To quote again, loneliness is the feeling of being deserted by all human companionship. It is the experience of not belonging to the world at all, which is among the most radical and desperate experiences of man. And this is Berkowitz. Totalitarian movements succeed when they offer rootless people what they most crave, an ideologically consistent world aiming at grand narratives that give meaning to their lives. By consistently repeating a few key ideas, a manipulative leader provides a sense of rootedness grounded upon a coherent fiction that is consistent, comprehensible, and predictable. My takeaway is this. Totalitarian movements thrive on human loneliness. Unitarian Universalist communities are a bomb to heal human loneliness. Totalitarian movements undermine the human capacity for free and critical thinking. Unitarian Universalist communities sanctify free and critical thinking. With the entirety of my being, I believe that our Unitarian Universalist communities are an answer to the threat of authoritarian and totalitarian mass movements, like the one underway right here in our country, threatening the dream of democracy that was born here among our conquered ancestors. I believe it is so because we are a people of open hearts and open minds like we teach our youngest. Arendt insists that thoughtful people encouraged to think freely and critically can resist the temptation of grand fictional narratives, can resist the idolatry of charismatic demagogues, even in the midst of those shifting plates, that shaky ground we are a faith tradition that practices, encourages, and even sanctifies free and critical thinking. We've enshrined the free and responsible search for truth and meaning in our current principles and our proposed value statement. 
We covenant to learn from one another in our free and responsible search for truth and meaning. As we prepare to embark on our ministry journey together, the first thing we need to do is remember our heritage of free thinking, remember our promise to learn from and support one another on our collective quest for truth and meaning, remember to keep our minds wide open. One of the refrains I heard during our many conversations this week is your con concern about declining rates of participation in membership in the congregation. And as you know, this is a concern across the denomination and across religious communities all over the country. I hear that you want this cherished community to thrive for another 400 years and more into the future. I share your concern and your desire. Like you, I believe that this first parish in Concord community is a balm for lonely lives and a wellspring of creative thinking and action. We want others to benefit from the blessings of heart and mind, as so many of you have benefited. I share your concern, your desire, and your vision for a thriving First Parish future. I pledge to work with you to make it so. And I also want to lift up another vision and possibility for collective human thriving that we can work on at the same time. Let's keep faith and have hope in the healing that we make happen and the creative action that we inspire when we bring our open hearts and minds out of these sacred walls beyond the doors of this blessed sanctuary. I often think of church as the place where we practice our skills and condition our muscles so that we can go forth into the world strengthened for the work of building the beloved community. Here together, in this holy moment, we gather to open our hearts and minds so that we can bring those open hearts and minds into all the spaces and relationships and communities that give shape to our lives, to your homes and families, your neighborhoods, schools, clubs, civic groups, town meetings, public squares, workplaces, and more. In this way, we extend and multiply the tensile strands of love that bind us, growing and healing the web of life, making it expansive and strong enough to hold each and every living soul. Wherever this wild journey of life takes us, and wherever this winding and wondrous path of our shared ministry leads us. Let us remember always to bring our open hearts and open minds to bear on all that we will encounter. Let us remember. How good it is to be on the solid ground we make together 
when we bind our hearts in love and our minds in creativity. May we continue to make it so for many days and months, and I hope years to come. Seven thirty out in Nashville. Airplane bottles on my tray. The heavens get to shaking. It's a stranger's hand I'm taking. We pray. We pray. Coats and lots of coffee. Wearing worry on my face. The chapel's out of waiting rooms. The family's waiting on the news. We pray. book you read if you do or don't believe oh we pray cause in the end we pray we pray when I close my eyes I call out your name we pray and I said this simple prayer we pray. Our Father, what in heaven? We pray. Hallowed be thy name. Cause in the end, we pray. And in the end, we pray.
Good morning. Good morning. My name is Reverend Elizabeth Ide, she, her, and it's my honor to help bring forward more of our prayers. We, we've been praying, my friends. We are all in this room and on this online space because we care about each other. We care about the whole world. We have decided to create this space of beloved community because that which matters to any of us is important to all of us. Together, we honor the sacred moments and turning points in our lives so that whatever we are carrying, we will not carry it alone. Every week, this practice reminds us that we are part of something greater than ourselves and that a spark of the universe's totality is in each of us too. We offer one another our presence, our open hearts, and our prayers. Today, we hold in our thoughts those who are working to amplify hope and raise awareness for mental health throughout the month of May. Blessed be the care providers, the advocates, the listeners, and the seekers. May all find kindness and ease. We also hold in our hearts all of our cohabitants of this beautiful and broken world. And we pray for peace in the Middle East. We pray for all of the people of Palestine and all of the people of Israel, and for all who bring aid to the suffering. We pray for the safety and well-being of people of every faith and no faith. We pray that all interactions are guided by compassion. We pray for all of the children and for all of us who were once children. In confusion and despair, may there be solidarity and hope. Blessed be the process. Let us now turn our attention to the love that brings all of us together. And into this sacred time, I invite all of us to say aloud or type the concerns and hopes closest to your own heart. The names of the loved ones you are holding, you may type them in the chat if you are ready, or speak their names out loud in whatever space you are in. We acknowledge and hold in our hearts all of the prayers, spoken and unspoken. We hold and care all who are still looking for community, all who still need a place to bring their own joys and sorrows. May they find love. May they find peace. Our prayer today continues with words adaptive from those written by Kenneth P. Longer. Spirit of life and love, source of all wisdom and mercy, let us take this time together to be open to forgiveness and be forgiven. Let us be open to diversity and be accepted. Let us be open to expression and be understood. Let us be open to compassion and be loved. Let us be open to awareness and be known. Let us be open to sharing, to exchange, to possibility, to awakening, and be hopeful. Let us be open to gratitude and be blessed. Amen.
please now. <laughs> Heed these favorite and fitting closing words, perhaps familiar to many of you by the Reverend Wayne Arneson. Take courage, friends. The way is often hard, the path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. Take courage, for deep down, there is another truth. You are not alone. Please rise in body or spirit and join in our closing hymn. It's number 145. The words are on your screen as tranquil streams. Did it again, choir. <laughs> Please join now in our chalice extinguishing ritual when we recite together the traditional words of benediction. The words are on your screen. Go out in the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, return to no person, evil for evil, Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all beings. We invite you to be seated as our service concludes with the postlude, and I hope to see you on the other side. <laughs>